All right. How's everybody doing today? Hotep. Hey, this is uh, Michael M. Hotep. It is Wednesday, July 31st, 2019. And we are live. So it looks like we're on here. Okay. Broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Hope everybody's doing well today. So, um, I wanted to talk about this topic. I talked about it a little bit on my Sunday night show, the African History Network show. And you see a lot of articles um, that are being posted right now, on social media, dealing with the red summer of 1919. And we know that uh, this is the 100th year anniversary of the red summer taking place. This is 2019. Uh, and then also July 27th was the uh, anniversary of the, the 100th year anniversary of the beginning of the Chicago race ride of 1919. That was uh, part of the Red Summer as well. OK, so I want to talk about um, the Red Summer of 1919. There were over 25 major race rides in America, but African-American World War One veterans fought back. African-American World War I veterans fought back. And then oftentimes when the Red Summer is talked about, the role that uh, Black World War I veterans play is not really talked about a lot, all right? Um, so everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in also. I'm gonna give you a lot of information. Um, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Um, also, okay, email us at customer service at African History Network.com, customer service at African History Network.com, and uh, we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Uh, I will be in Atlanta Saturday, August 3rd. Those in the Atlanta area, I'll be in Atlanta Saturday, August 3rd, 2019 with uh, Michi X and Jice Johnson for the Black Agenda Tour. So visit um, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com for more information, or the Black Agenda on Tour.com, the Black Agenda on Tour.com. We'll, uh, we'll be at Finn and Feathers, Finn and Feathers uh, in Atlanta, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., okay? All right, so let's jump into this story. Now, a lot of people celebrate African American History Month, right? Black History Month, what used to be called Black History Month. But a lot of people don't know there's an annual theme for Black History Month, okay? And this year's theme was Black Migrations, Black Migrations, okay? And this ties into uh, this year's theme of African American History Month, a number of different historical periods of time or historical events is not just the transatlantic slave trade in August 20th, 1619, Jamestown, Virginia. And a lot of people are commemorating uh, the year of return in 400 years since uh, 1619, even though African people have been in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago. We were here tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade started or before Native Americans even came into existence. And if you read the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep, he breaks this information down, okay, in, in his book. Um, so you'll hear about Jamestown, Virginia this year as well, and uh, the year of return, but also dealing with black migrations, that theme, that annual theme for African American History Month, and it's a theme that should be studied and commemorated all year long. You also have the Great Migration of 1915 to 1970, the Great Migration, okay? And in my presentations I did um, for African American History Month for the month of February, and I spoke at about 15 different events in the uh, Detroit area, uh, but also in a lot of my presentations I've been doing this year, I've been talking about black migrations, the great migration, et cetera. And with the great migration, this is uh, this starts the second year of World War One. So World War One is 1914 to 1918. All right. So the great migration is basically um, 1915 and 1970. You'll see some sources that will say 1916. And you're going to have 
um, about 6 million African Americans migrating from uh, the South up North. All right. So prior to the great migration starting about 90% of African Americans lived in the South for various reasons. Okay. Cause <laughs> because of slavery, right? <laughs> so 90% of African Americans uh, are going to uh, live in the South prior to the great, uh, great migration starting. And let me just bring up this. Um, let me just bring up this slide here to show you uh, some information. This is some of the information I share in uh, my lecture dealing with the uh, black migrations and the great migration. Let's flip over here and let's see. Hold on. Just bear with me while I switch screens. Okay, and let's turn the screen share on. Okay. All right, let's turn this on here. Okay, so I can show you this. All right, yeah, so my presentations that I did uh, during African American History Month, I, I talked about this. So the Great Migration was the um, relocation of more than 6 million African Americans from the rural South to the cities of the North, Midwest and West from about 1916 to 1970, or about 1915, 1970. Driven from their homes by unsatisfactory economic opportunities and harsh segregationist laws, Jim Crow laws, many African Americans headed North where they took advantage of the need for industrial workers that first arose during the first world war, World War I. During the Great Migration, African Americans began to build a new place for themselves in public life, actively confronting racial prejudice as well as economic, political, and social challenges to create a, a, a black urban culture that would exert enormous influence in the decades to come. So by the end of 1919, so World War I is 1914 to 1918. By the end of 1919, some one million African Americans had left the South, usually traveling by train, boat, or bus. A similar, uh, a smaller number had automobiles or even horse-drawn carts or carriages. In the decade between 1910 and 1920, the African American population of major northern cities grew by large percentages, including New York by 66% and Chicago by 148%. So July 27th, you saw articles, uh, July 27, 2019, you saw articles talking about the Chicago race ride in 1919. The Chicago race ride in 1919 started July 27th, okay, because of the incident that happened at Lake Michigan and the killing of a 17 year old African-American man named, uh, a teenager named Eugene Williams. Well, the African-American population in Chicago had exploded. And as we see this taking place, as we see this black migration taking place and African-Americans moving into Detroit and Gary, Indiana and Chicago, Illinois, New York, New York, et cetera. That we saw as more African-Americans came into these cities, we saw it caused a, a uh, increase in uh, competition for jobs an increase in demands put on social services and an increase in racial conflagration, racial tensions, okay? And it's going to explode. We saw the population in, from 1910 to 1920, the population of Philadelphia, of African-Americans in Philadelphia grew by 500%. The population of African-Americans in Detroit, where Henry Ford was in Highland Park, Michigan. Highland Park is an enclave of Detroit. We know African-Americans are running to Detroit for jobs and factories. That population, of African-Americans from 1910 to 1920 grew by 611%. And we see in Detroit, that's going to explode with the Detroit race ride, Detroit race ride in 1943. In uh, June of 1943, I think it was, you have a, a, a huge race ride during World War II up and down Michigan Avenue, I'm sorry, up and down Woodward Avenue in, um, in Detroit. Okay, so these are things that are these are tensions that are taking place leading to the um 
red summer of 1919. Rising rents in segregated areas, plus a resurgence of Ku Klux Klan activity after 1915 worsened African-American and white relations across the country. The summer of 1919 began the greatest period of interracial strife in U.S. history at that time, including a disturbing wave of race riots. Check out the article from history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel. Uh, they have an article called Great Migration that uh, digs into this. OK, they have a number of, uh, of good articles there. OK, so this is uh, the time period that we're looking at. This is what's taking place. How's everybody doing? OK, share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. Also, Gail, Martel, Clyde. Uh, just a few of the people watching on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. And then also uh, register for the online course that I teach on Wednesdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We do it Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, we do the class live at our online school. And then it's recorded, it's archived. You can go back and watch it over and over again. OK, so class, uh, so this week we'll do class number six um, on uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, the class is regularly one hundred thirty dollars. It was discounted to eighty dollars, but uh, we just dropped the price down to sixty dollars. So as soon as you register, you can watch classes one through five. And there's about thirty six hours of bonus content. Also, you can watch from around the world. Uh, we just posted the link here or you can go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. OK, and we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. All right, let's continue here. OK, so um, you have the great migration that is going to add to the tensions uh, that are going to uh, explode during the um, during the red summer. All right. OK, so let's continue. Uh, History.com has a good article uh, that I read. I've read a number of good articles dealing with the Red Summer. But this is from July 26, 2019. And this is called uh, Red Summer of 1919, How Black World War I Vets Fought Back Against Racist Mobs. Red Summer of 1919, How Black World War I Vets Fought Back Against Racist Mobs. When dozens of brutal race riots erupted across the U.S. in the wake of World War I and the Great Migration, black veterans stepped up to defend their communities against white violence. We saw something like this happen also after the Civil War, because you had about 100 and close to 200,000, about 186,000 African-Americans who served in World War, uh, served in the Civil War. And when they served in the Civil War, they were taught how to fight. How to how to use weapons, things like this, right? And they're going to come back and 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 bring these skills back to their community and defend their communities against the Ku Klux Klan, against the bigots, bigots, against the white supremacists, against the bushwhackers. All right, we're, we're going to see uh, something similar like this happen after World War One. So World War One is 1914 and 1918. 1919, the Red Summer explodes. All right. So the ink had barely dried on the Treaty of Versailles, OK, which formally in this treaty is what formally ended World War One. When recently returned African-American veterans grabbed their guns and stationed themselves on rooftops in African-American neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., prepared to act as snipers in the case of mob violence in July of 1919 during the summer. Others set up blockades around Howard University, which is in Washington, D.C. Howard University, an African-American intellectual hub, creating a protective ring around the residents there around Howard University. White sailors recently home from the war had been on a days long drunken rampage, assaulting and in some cases lynching African-Americans on the Capitol's streets. OK, the, the, 
Washington Capitol, Washington, D.C. The relentless onslaught proved contagious, escalating in dozens of cities across the U.S. in what would become known as the Red Summer. The, now, just let me pause here because we're broadcasting on social media platforms and some social media platforms have new standards, things like this. One, this is not hate speech. We're talking about history. OK, so this is not hate speech. All right. Two, what I say may go outside. It's a conference of some people's awareness just because you never heard it before, disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. All right. And this 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 deals with. Uh, see, 2019 is the 100th year anniversary of the Red Summer. OK, so this is part of our history to understand what is taking place today in this country, to understand where we are, not just African-Americans in this country, but where we are uh, as a country. We have to understand this history. All right. So talking about this history does not promote racism, talking about this history exposes racism, okay? And so I, I, I want to be clear. When we talk about attacks on African Americans or when we talk about racism, that's not promoting racism. That's not condoning it. Condoning it that's dealing with history. Just as when Jews talk about the Holocaust, that's not promoting Nazis. That's not promoting the Holocaust. That's exposing what happening, happened and remembering that history so it does not happen again, because those who don't know their history are destined to repeat it. OK, so let's continue. Let's go back to this article from uh, this is from history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel. Uh, Red Summer 1919, how black World War One vets fought back against racist mobs. And this is from July 26, 2019, written by Abigail Higgins. OK. Now, during this period of time with African-American vets coming back, OK, there were about three hundred and eighty thousand uh, African-Americans who fought in World War One or, or who served in World War One. Um, when they come back, you're also going to have what's called the new Negro. OK. And the new Negro was a new sense of pride and dignity that African-Americans had, not just African-American soldiers, but African-Americans in general had in this country. And what we were saying was, is that we fought for this country, we died for this country, we want all of our rights right now. We're not gonna deal with segregation, we're not gonna deal with these lynchings, et cetera. We want all of our rights right now. So the new Negro was a new sense of pride OK, a new sense of dignity. And this is what's taking place at this time as well. And the new Negro that is also going to fuel Negro History Week in 1926, created by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. We know that uh, 1915 was the year that the movie The Birth of a Nation came out. And in, in my presentations this year, you know, I, I get deep into this history. Um, we have a, uh, I forgot to tell you, we have a new uh, bundle pack on my DVDs, a six DVD bundle pack, uh, and it's dealing with black migrations, okay? That's available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and we'll post the uh, link here also, because it, it deals with uh, my presentations that I've done this year, okay? And they deal with black migrations, the red, some of all of this stuff. OK, because uh, this is a pivotal time in history and this is the 100th year anniversary of, of a number of different things. All right. So we'll post the uh, OK, I just posted the link right here. Yeah. The uh, Black Migration 6 DVD bundle pack. All right. That's on sale of uh, fifty dollars and the six of my presentations I've done this year. OK, so uh, February 8th, 1915. Uh, is when the movie The Birth of a Nation came out. And in the slides that I showed you, it talked about a resurgence in the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK was re rejuvenated because largely because of the movie The Birth of a Nation, which debuted February 8th, 1915. And it depicted the Ku Klux Klan as being the heroes. All right. The movie The Birth of a Nation um, is based upon a novel by a man named Thomas Dixon, Reverend Thomas Dixon. OK. And. The book is called the, the novel is called The Klansman. And 
it it made the Ku Klux Klan the heroes, and it basically deals with a um, plantation in Piedmont, South Carolina, and the it, the movie and the novel deals with slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction, and it shows how prior to slavery the enslaved Africans on this plantation were happy slaves. They loved their master. They were treated almost as family members, almost like they were human. And then the civil war is going to happen. It's going to destroy the South, disrupt the livelihood uh, of these uh, 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 white people in the South, of the plantation owners, the, the uh, aristocrats, things like this. And then reconstruction comes from 1865 to 1877 and it shows these um, former Union Negro soldiers going into this town in South Carolina. Keep in mind South Carolina is where the Civil War started. South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union December 20th 1860 and South Carolina is where the, is where the Civil War started the attack on Fort Sumter uh, April 12, 1861. So this movie, The Birth of a Nation, was part of a larger 150 year campaign called The Lost Cause, which was designed to reframe why the Civil War was fought and to make it about states rights and to say that the union was infringing upon their rights and to make the case that um, um, the Confederacy really wasn't that bad and slavery re really wasn't that bad, things like this. This is this whole Lost Cause uh, campaign. OK, so when they talk about General Robert E. Lee and how General Robert E. Lee was fighting to end slavery and he was really a nice guy, things like this. That's part of that whole lost cause campaign, because General Robert E. Lee was a brutal slave owner who committed treason against the U.S. and took up arms um, and fought against the U.S. OK, and th there's an article from the Atlantic dot com called The Myth of the Kindly General Lee, The Myth of the Kindly General Lee. OK, people should read it, including Donald Trump when he talked about how um, uh, great of a military strategist General Robert E. Lee was. And, you know, these guys love General Robert E. Lee, et cetera. OK, I think he's been watching too much of the Dukes of Hazard. Incidentally, the Dukes of Hazard was part of that whole lost cause campaign. OK, either intentionally or unintentionally. The reason why is, is because um they displayed the Confederate battle flag in that TV show and they took away the hatred from the Confederate battle flag. And the reason why it was reintroduced and became popular again, it became popular again in opposition to African-Americans fighting for civil rights. OK, and fighting to be treated as human beings. And it, and it, it, it is brought back out and really rejuvenated in 1948 when Strom Thurmond runs for president uh, as a Dixiecrat. The Dixiecrats were the Southern segregationist faction of the Democratic Party. And he runs as a Dixiecrat and he runs in opposition to the overall Democratic Party that adopted a more pro civil rights uh, platform for the 1947, 1948 presidential campaign. And the, the, the Confederate battle flag is brought back out in opposition to African-Americans fighting for civil rights. All right. But when we uh, read this article here from the Atlantic dot com called the myth of the kindly General Lee. And also it's important to understand. That what people call the Confederate flag is not really the Confederate flag. That's actually the Confederate battle flag of northern Virginia under General Robert E. Lee's army. That there were three flags that flew over the Confederate States of America from 1861 to 1865. That flag it was never one of them. So when you have the white supremacists out carrying the Confederate battle flag, calling, calling it the Confederate flag, they are showing how ignorant they are of history. Not, not only that, when you study General Robert E. Lee, General Robert E. Lee was against using the Confederate flags after the Civil War was over with. And he was against Confederate monuments, including Confederate monuments dedicated to him. He was against all of that because he felt that um, the, 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 the country had been torn apart by the Civil War. And there was still. Um, there was still hatred between the North and the South, even after the Civil War ends. And you felt there had to be a period of time of healing. 
between the North and the South. And he felt that the Confederate monuments, the statues, the uses of the Confederate flags, it kept those wounds open and did not allow that healing to happen. So he was against, he was against all of that. OK, so when you see these white supremacists out trying to save a statue dedicated to General Robert E. Lee, they don't know he didn't even want a statue. He was against Confederate monuments. All right. So let's continue. But read that article, The Myth of the Kindly General Lee. And then incidentally, on the TV show, The Dukes of Hazard, Who was the car named after that born Luke Duke drove in and jumped over cliffs in? It's called General Lee. It's named after General Robert E. Lee. All right, so um, this is why this year's theme of Black Migrations for African American History Month, which was the theme chosen by ASALA, Association for the Study of African American Life and History. They are the governing body of African American History Month, Black History Month. This is why their um, theme is so, is so powerful, so important, okay? And just very briefly here in, um, let me see. Let me bring this up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my time with this here. Um, let me let me show you this quickly. I, I want to look very quickly at this theme. And the reason why is one, uh, basically everywhere I spoke for African-American History Month, nobody knew there was an annual theme. OK, there's a theme that has been a theme going back basically to 1928. I've gone and looked at all the themes uh, two, if you don't know there's an annual theme, that means you really don't understand how to celebrate African American History Month. And these themes are, are to be celebrated and studied, celebrated and studied all year. Okay, so we don't we don't understand this. All right, here's Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Um, let me pull up the statement dealing with black migrations okay this is from asala's website us uh let me make sure this is up okay you all can see this all right how many people knew what this year's theme for black history month was african-american history month asala's 2019 theme black migrations emphasizes the movement of people of african descent to new destinations and subsequently to new social realities while inclusive of earlier centuries. This theme focuses especially on the 20th century through today. 20th century, dealing with the 1900s, dealing with the 1900s through today. Beginning in the early decades of the 20th century, African-American migration patterns included relocation from southern farms to southern cities, from south to the northeast, midwest and west, from the Caribbean to U.S. cities, as well as to migrant labor farms and the immigration of noted African-Americans to Africa and to European cities such as Paris and London after the end of World War One and, and World War Two. OK, uh, let's see here. Let me continue. That's all I put in the presentation, but uh, here's the rest of it. Such migrations resulted in a more diverse and stratified interracial and intraracial urban population amid a changing social melee, such as the rise of the Garvey movement, Marcus Garvey, Universal Negro Improvement Association, such as the rise of the Garvey movement in New York, Detroit and New Orleans, the emergence of black industrial workers and black entrepreneurs, the growing and very and variety of urban churches and new religion, new religions, new music forms like ragtime, blues and jazz, white backlash as in the red summer of 1919, the blossoming of visual and liter literary arts as in New York, Washington, D.C., Chicago, and Paris in the 1910 and 1920s. They're talking about like the Harlem Renaissance. The, the theme, Black Migrations, equally lends itself to the exploration of the centuries later decades from spatial and social perspectives with attention to new African-Americans because of the burgeoning 
African and Caribbean population in the US, Northern African Americans uh, return to the South, okay? Because we're being gentrified out of the North. So a lot of us are going back down South. Racial suburbanization, inner city hyper ghettoization, health and environment, civil rights and protest activism, electoral politics, mass incarceration and dynamic cultural production okay so this is the the theme this year for african american history month but this is a theme to be commemorated and celebrated and studied all year long you see how comprehensive it is it's not just recycling the same 15 to 20 sanitized negroes every year that's not what african american history month is about okay it has purpose all right, let's continue. So for more information, also visit uh, asala.org, A-S-A-L-H.org, okay, asala.org. How's everybody doing today? Share this broadcast uh, on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in as well. And then, um, so my presentations I've been doing this year ties into uh, this theme dealing with black migrations. Okay, we'll post a link here also. That's to the uh, six DVD bundle pack, the Black Migration six DVD bundle pack. Those are my presentations that I've done so far this year. All right, so let's go back to this article from uh, history.com. I just want to give you some of this background information. So, because I know people are coming with different levels of understanding of history. All right. So this deals with the Red Summer of 1919 and how Black World War I veterans fought back. Okay, so the uh, white sailors recently home from World War One had been on a days long drunken rampage, assaulting and in some cases lynching uh, African Americans on the uh, cap on Washington D.C.'s uh, streets, the nation's capital. The relentless onslaught proved contagious, escalating in dozens of cities across the U.S in what will become known as the Red Summer. Now, it was James Weldon Johnson of the NAACP who also wrote uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which became the Black National Anthem. He's the one that named it the Red Summer. The racist attacks in 1919 were, uh, were widespread and often indiscriminate, but in many places, they were initiated by white servicemen, okay, white military men, and centered upon the 380,000 African-American uh, veterans uh, who had just returned from the war. Now, they, uh, they made a little mistake here. There was uh, approximately 380,000 African-Americans who served in World War I. We know all of them didn't come back, okay? So it's, it's hundreds of thousands of African-American um, veterans that they were targeting, all right? Quote, because of their military service, Black veteran, black veterans were seen as a particular threat to Jim Crow and racial subordination, end quote, notes a report from the Equal Justice Initiative. That's attorney Brian Stevenson and his group, the Equal Justice Initiative. Once again, as I said, you had the new Negro mentality. You had these brothers coming back home. They said, we fought for our country. We died for our country. We shed blood. We want first class citizenship. We want all of our rights, not just for us as veterans, but for all of our people. We want all of our rights now. We're not going to deal with this Jim Crow. We're not going to deal with the beatings. We're not going to deal with these lynchings. So indeed, many African-American soldiers returned from the war armed with a renewed determination to fight segregation and a near constant barrage of brutality. We're going to see a similar mentality from African-Americans coming back from World War II also. OK, and, and this is going to push in one of the things that leads to the modern day civil rights movement. A postal official wrote at the time, about 1919, around that time. That, quote, as far as the first movement of the American troops to France, the Negro publicists began to avail themselves of the argument that since the Negro was fit to wear the uniform, he was therefore fit for everything else, end quote. OK, now in Texas, a federal agent reported, quote, one of the principal elements causing concern is the returned Negro soldier 
who was not readily fitting back into his prior status of pre-war times, end quote. They mean know your place. They mean fit back into Jim Crow segregation, fit back into the back of the bus. They said, no, we ain't going for that. So at the time, cities across the north were being reshaped by the Great Migration. By the end of 1919, as I stated before, about one million African-Americans had fled segregation and a total lack of economic opportunities in the south for northern cities. It, a lack of economic opportunities in general. Some of us are being ran off of our land. Some of us are losing our farms, uh, things like this. It, it, are you going to have some prosperous African-Americans in the south? Yes, you are. OK, but even for those who own farms many of them still going to be poor many of them are still going to struggle okay so between 1910 and 1920 the black population we saw in chicago grew by 148 percent philadelphia by 500 percent uh creating massive anxiety among white people in northern cities that african americans were taking jobs taking houses and and taking away their sense of security from them okay taking away their jobs taking away their houses and taking away a sense of security from them doesn't this sound like some of the same language donald trump uses for undocumented immigrants yet he has no problem exploiting their labor at his golf courses in new york and new jersey this sounds like if, if you saw um the African History Network show from Sunday, I talked about how a lot of the language Trump uses to describe undocumented immigrants and demonize them and dehumanize them is some of the lang same language used for African slaves in this country. And even after slavery. So during the Red Summer, massive anxiety became mass violence. During the Red Summer, that we are commemorating this year and studying this year. This, this is the 100th year anniversary of the Red Summer 1919. During the Red Summer, massive anxiety from white people, some white people, not, not, not all white people, not wholesale condemnation, but some white people was enough to cause a, enough to cause 25 major race riots, over, over 25 major race riots in this country. This anxiety became mass violence. Between April and November of 1919, there would be approximately 25 riots and instances of mob violence. There were 97 recorded lynchings in 1919 alone. Okay. A three day long massacre in Elaine, Arkansas. This is the Elaine race riot of 1919, during which over 200 African American men, women, and children were killed after black sharecroppers tried to organize for better working conditions and better pay. This is the Elaine. This is one of the biggest race riots in this country. The Elaine, uh, Arkansas race ride of 1919. Now the Ku Klux Klan, which had been largely shut down by the government after the civil war. Okay. Uh, experience. So it, it, civil war during reconstruction, they're going to exist, but there's going to be suppression of them. And you, you have there's going to be suppression of them uh, because the Union troops are in the South. Now, after Reconstruction ends in 1877, they're going to flourish even more. Um, and then you had the. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 18, I think it was 1871, 1875, something like that. Uh, OK, but after Reconstruction, they're going to flourish more to Klan. But it's also important to understand. The Klan is probably the most prominent of those types of groups, but they were not the only one. OK, so uh, the KKK, which had been largely shut down by the government after the Civil War, experienced a resurgence in popularity and began carrying out dozens of lynchings across the South. Just a few years earlier, many uh, young African-American men had heeded um, President Wood Woodrow Wilson's call to make the world safe for democracy. 
and they went off to fight for America in one of uh, history's bloodiest wars. OK, um, World War One. Now they had come back to a country that recognized neither their service nor their humanity. They, the, the, the U.S. Rec did not recognize their service largely, their service or their humanity. Having just returned from battle, however, African-American veterans were not inclined to take the abuse lying down. Across the country, former soldiers used their government provided weapons training to defend their neighborhoods against vicious white mobs. Quote, black people. Now, this is uh, Simon Balto, B-A-L-T-O. Simon Balto is a professor of African-American history at the University of Iowa. And uh, he's the author of uh, the book Occupied Territory, Policing Black Chicago from Red Summer to Black Power. Occupied Territory, Policing Black Chicago from Red Summer to Black Power. Uh, Professor Simon Balto said, quote, black people formed ad hoc self-defense organizations to try to keep white folks from terrorizing their communities. Black veterans are instrumental in that because these because the black veterans were the ones who largely had the training, the training on how to fight, how to organize training on weapons. An example that we see of that, and it's partly a fictitious example, is the movie Rosewood by the late John Singleton. And in the movie Rosewood, you saw the fictitious character of man played by Ving Rhames. OK, and uh, so the Rosewood uh, massacre, that's uh, January of 1923 in Rosewood, Florida. And man, uh, the fictitious character of man, he was a former World War One veteran. OK, and when you when you watch the movie. He uses military strategy. And he, you know, he carries two forty fives. He knows how to use the guns. He knows how to use a shotgun, et cetera. But he uses military strategy to organize the uh, African Americans, and especially the the women and the children, and help get them to safety while while fighting and fending off the 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 Klan and the Klan sympathizers, et cetera. Okay, but he's a former World War One veteran. The, now he now he did not his that character did not historically exist. All right. He, he was probably he, he could very well have been a composite character of different acts that real life people did. And John Singleton just put that into one fictitious character of man. But he did not historically exist. OK, so. Um, Black veterans were a large part of what made the summer of 1919 in the words of historian David K. K David F. Krugler, K-R-U-G-L-E-R, -E the year that African-Americans fought back. Um, David Krugler said, quote, this is the country to which we soldiers of democracy return. OK, I'm, I'm sorry. This is what Dr. W.B. Du Bois said in Crisis Magazine, May of 1919. Quote, this is the country to which we soldiers of democracy return. This is the fatherland for which we fought. OK. And uh, so uh, W.B. Du Bois, civil rights activist and prominent intellectual, wrote in uh, the Crisis Magazine, which was the magazine of the NAACP, the Crisis Magazine in May of 1919. This was a month after the earliest event of the. Uh, Red Summer, which was a riot in Georgia, where six people, two white officers and four African-American men were killed at a church. Quote, but by but by the God of heaven, we are cowards and jackasses. If now that the war is over, we do not marshal every ounce of our brain of our brain and brawn to fight a sterner, longer, more unbending battle against the forces of hell in our own land, end quote. And that's Dr. W.B. Du Bois writing in the Crisis Magazine. Okay, so now in Washington, D.C., uh, in Washington, D.C., there were 5,000 African-American veterans. And for many of them, self-defense was a last resort after weeks and indeed decades of government inaction. 
One of the first people killed in Washington, D.C.'s violence was a 22 year old African-American veteran named uh, named Randall Neal. Randall Neal. At, at a high point of the mayhem, one Washington newspaper reported uh, the city had, quote, passed through its wildest and bloodiest nights since Civil War times, end quote. Many of the city's white owned newspapers fanned the flames of terror, reporting fabricated instances of African American men assaulting white women. Reporting the, these were these were some of the white newspapers there in Washington, DC, that reported fabricated instances of black men assaulting white women. In one case, the Washington Post ran a front page story advertising the location for white servicemen to meet and carry out further attacks on African-Americans in the city of Washington, D.C. OK, this is 1919. All right. This is 100 years ago. Now, in. In 1918, the year before, there were 64 lynchings in this country. OK, 64 recorded lynchings in 19. 1919, there were between 83 to 97. This article here, and I, this probably has more updated information. Uh, this says there were 97 lynchings of African Americans uh, in, in, in 1919, a year after World War I ends. Now, Washington, D.C. had a vibrant middle class that in many ways epitomized African Americans slow but expanding economic and social advances. The city's black population was growing rapidly thanks to the Great Migration. And in 1919, they made up a quarter of the population. They also held many jobs in the federal government and at the country's and, and at the country's first black owned bank, the Industrial Savings Bank. Uh, they, they held jobs also at the uh, first black owned bank, the Industrial Savings Bank. It was a limited but steady march forward, one that many white people felt needed to be stopped. They felt threat. You had some white people who felt threatened by this, by threat, threatened by this African-American advancement, threatened by these African-American men coming back from war, wearing their uniforms. And they're not saying, yeah, as a boss, and, 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 and they may not be stepping to the side of the sidewalk or stepping off the sidewalk to let white people walk by. They said, we're not taking this stuff anymore. So in the crisis magazine, James Weldon Johnson of the NAACP wrote, quote, I knew it to be true, but it was also an impossibility for me to realize as a truth that men and women of my race were being mobbed, chased, dragged from streetcars, beaten and killed within the shadow of the dome of the Capitol. Talking about Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. You got the U.S. Congress, the White House, uh, 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 U.S. Senate there. OK, and he's saying this is taking place in the nation's capital. All right. Within the shadow of the dome of the Capitol at the very front door of the White House, end quote. Now. As the situation escalated, President Woodrow Wilson, who we all know was a white supremacist, sympathizer to the Ku Klux Klan and um, D.W. Griffith, who directed uh, the movie The Birth of a Nation, did a private screening of The Birth of a Nation for President Woodrow Wilson at the White House. Now, as this situation escalated, President Wilson refused to act. He worried that the riots would damage the image he was cultivating of the United States as a global paragon of justice. Woodrow Wilson also had a demonstrated record of racism, including, among other things, tacit support of the Ku Klux Klan. So after four days of a racist mob of racist mob violence in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, an estimated 40 people were killed and dozens more were injured. The chaos was only quelled when 2000 uh, federal troops were deployed onto the city streets at the end of the month, just in time for the riots to spread to Chicago. They're going to spread to Chicago in uh, July 
of uh, 1919. All right. And uh, we'll come we'll come to that in just a minute. How's everybody doing here? Let's see who we have here. Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. Also, how do you all like this type of information? OK. And let's see who we have here. Uh, Habiba, Gigi. Just a few of the people watching. Okay, African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise um, with the African History Network and email us at customerservice at africanhistorynetwork.com, customerservice at africanhistorynetwork.com. All right, so summer is here and a lot of people trying to get back into shape and the Fast Life 28 Day Challenge can help you with that. Visit their website, tfl28.com tfl28.com so what this 28 day challenge does is it is an online coaching program that helps members tap into their body's natural ability to repair itself via fasting in this challenge they focus on utilizing fasting whole foods and movement to improve metabolic conditions such as obesity high blood pressure pre-diabetes type 2 diabetes high cholesterol and more they also have a secret facebook group uh for coaching and this is a four-week program okay they're going to have a new group starting up soon visit their website tfl 28.com tfl 28.com for more information and to register let them know you found out about this from the african history network all right so during this period of time a lot of people are also trying to get their financial uh house back in order as well uh you have uh, children going to school uh, go, uh going back to school and, and, and parents are are uh, buying school supplies and buying school clothes and they also want to get their financial house in order well certified financial planner martisha patterson can help you with this 2019 is here and there is no better time to start working on your financial goals she is a certified financial planner with over 19 years in the industry you've seen some of the interviews i've done with her as well and she's helping people just like you focus on and achieve their financial goals whether it deals with budgeting saving for emergencies retirement uh if you want to start investing etc okay visit her website pattersonplans17.com pattersonplans17.com uh for more information and let her know you found out about this from uh the african history network also pattersonplans17.com all right let's continue if you have any questions let me know and everybody uh, if you like this type of information also be sure to register for the uh, online course that i teach because uh, we teach it again uh, we do it on wednesdays uh 8 p.m eastern standard time ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school okay so we're doing the class um live tonight 8 p.m to 10 p.m eastern standard time we'll get into some of the history of why the moors lost power in Spain. Uh, the class is regularly $130. It was 80. We discounted down to uh, $60. And as soon as you register, you can watch the first five classes and there's about 36 hours of bonus content. So we posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast is also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com right on the home page. Okay. If you need me to post this again, post the link again, let me know. Okay. Let's continue uh, with the uh, red summer of 1919 how african-american uh world war one veterans helped to fight back now we see the um race ride from washington dc we see is going to spread to chicago so just two days after federal troops withdrew from washington dc an African-American teenager named Eugene Williams was killed by a white man in Chicago, lighting the match that would kick off a week of violent riots. OK, and History.com also has a good article. And I've read a number of articles dealing with the Chicago race riot of uh, 1919. Um, Blackpass.org has one Chicago race riot 1919. There's, uh, I've read some from I've read a number of different articles dealing with this. 
Uh, History.com has one, the Chicago Race Rider 1919, and they talk about how uh, it was a 17-year-old African-American teenager named Eugene Williams who um, was killed, okay? And this is what started the uh, riot. So on July 27th, 1919, July 27th, 1919, a 17-year-old African-American boy named Eugene Williams was swimming with friends in Lake Michigan. OK, when he crossed the unofficial barrier located at 29th Street between the city's white and black beaches. This is the unofficial barrier that separated the white beach from the black beach. Now, some from some articles I've written, it was like an imaginary barrier also. OK, but it was the unofficial barrier that separated the white beach from the black beach. OK, so a group of white men threw stones at Eugene Williams, hitting him and he drowned. When police uh, officers arrived on the scene, they refused to arrest the white man uh, who the white man who black eyewitnesses pointed to as the responsible party. And actually in one of these, uh, his name was George Starber. S-T-A-U-B-E-R, George Stauber. That was that was the name of the white man who started pelting, uh, who, who was throwing rocks at Eugene Williams. OK, so. After you have African-Americans, they're pointing to the guys telling the police, this is the guy who did it. This is the guy who hit him. All right. So a group of white men threw stones at Eugene Williams, hitting him and he drowned. When police officers arrived on the scene, they refused to arrest the white man, George Stauber who uh, African-American eyewitnesses pointed to as the responsible party. Angry crowds began to gather on the beach and reports of the incident, uh, many, uh, many of the reports distorted or exaggerated spread quickly, okay? And we're gonna see this oftentimes with, with, with a lot of these riots that break out, a, a lot of times the incident that triggered it is either exaggerated or is totally, totally lied about. And it causes mass chaos. It causes beatings, injuries, killings, etc. cetera. All right. Um, if we go back to the, I'm, I'm going to switch back and forth between these two articles. So just bear with me because I want to get these details here because this is, this is very important. A rock hit Eugene Williams in the head, knocking him unconscious. His body went limp and slipped into the lake, Lake Michigan. No one got to Eugene Williams in time to save him. A white police officer refused to arrest George Stauber, S-T-A-U-B-E-R. Despite a growing crowd of angry witnesses, uh, the, uh, and the, they refused to arrest him uh, for the murder. By the time Eugene Williams' lifeless body had been removed from the lake, a crowd of around 1,000 African-Americans had gathered, demanding action. For many people, Eugene Williams' death was a microcosm of the long-standing violence perpetuated against African-Americans without consequence. Okay, so when we look at the, uh, the race riot of 1919, violence soon broke out between gangs and mobs of African-Americans and white people concentrated in the South side uh, Chicago neighborhood surrounding the stockyards. After police were unable to quell the riots, the state militia was called in on the fourth day, but in the fighting, uh, 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 but the fighting continued until August 3rd, okay? Shootings, beatings, and arson attacks eventually left 15 white people and 23 African-Americans dead, and more than 500 more people were injured. Around 60% of the people injured were, Af were African-Americans. An additional 1,000 African-American families were left homeless after rioters torched their residences. Okay, now, if we look at July 31st, see EGI.org, and you see pretty much each day I post um, this day in history from EGI.org, Equal Justice Initiative. July 31st, 1919, white mob uh, attacks Chicago's black communities. By noon on July 31st, 1919, this is, this is dealing with the Chicago race riot, 
which was from July 27th, 1919 to August 3rd, 1919. Okay, so we so we in we're in that time period. By noon of July 31st, 1919, more than 30 fires had been set in Chicago's African American neighborhood, set by angry white mobs. These acts of arson were part of an extended barrage of violence targeting Chicago's black community during a summer field with racial violence in America. This season was dubbed uh, the Red Summer and saw attacks targeting African-American communities um, erupting in major cities throughout the country. The five days of riots and attacks that upended Chicago are, are widely considered the worst of the Red, uh, Red Summer riots. OK. OK. So then they go into how it started and things like that. So you can check this out. Uh, you can read this yourself. We'll post a link here. This is from EJI.org. That's the Equal Justice Initiative. And they have um, a, a post each day dealing with like this day in history, tying into African-American history. They'll talk about lynchings attacks on African-Americans, et cetera. And they talk about how this, this history has to be reconciled with for us to move forward and to address what's going on today. We have to reconcile with this history. So this is not, I, when, when I, when I, when I talk about this, I don't want people to think because once again, different social media platforms have new, um, have new standards, etc. Okay, so I, I'm not doing this to attack people. I'm not trying to attack people, different races, ethnicities, or something. We're dealing with this history, okay. And then also, I mean, these are articles from History.com, the official website of the History Channel. So we can't move uh, forward until we uh, address and reconcile this history, and we have to remember it so it does not happen again. Okay, who we have here? Let's continue. Uh, we got uh, Habiba. All right, just a few of the people watching. Renee. Okay, Renee, Habiba. Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. All right. Okay, <laughs> Renee said, makes one not want to ever come out uh, into the public these days. All right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, well, yeah, well, yeah. Okay, I'm not going to respond to that. Okay. <laughs> I guess I, I guess it depends upon uh, which city you live in. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Okay, so um, in response to the protest, armed white men jumped in a car and tore through the city streets, firing into black homes and businesses. A white mob marched down the street, assaulting African-American pedestrians and torching black homes. Still, police refused to act. OK, this is in Chicago. So we know that um, they had to let's see. All right. Uh, better, so when the. When the riot explodes, it's not so much some kind of a spontaneous event as it is a culmination, says Simon Balto, okay, professor of African American um, studies at the at Iowa was this Iowa University University of Iowa, okay, uh, Simon Balto, B A L T O, and this is still talking about the Chicago race riot in nineteen nineteen. When the uh, quote, when the riot explodes, it is not so much uh, some kind of spontaneous event as it is a culmination. OK, now, in the two previous years, white supremacists had bombed over 25 African-American homes in an effort to keep African-Americans out of the city of Chicago. And the police never intervened in those bombings also. So when this happens in 1919, it's not because of one event. It is an explosion, a culmination of other events that took place. Now, African-American veterans in Chicago formed formed militias to defend African-American homes, neighborhoods and families when uh, police and, and the government refused to intervene and refused to protect them. In the time following Eugene Williams death, one group of black veterans broke into an armory and stole weapons they then used to beat back a mob of white people quote because many uh, now uh, professor simon balto said quote because many of them 
have actually seen battlefield combat. They are willing and capable of using violence for the purpose of self-defense, end quote. OK, and I, and, and I wouldn't even refer to it as using violence for the purpose of self-defense. I would just call it self-defense. Now, once again, you know, I'm not advocating attacking people or anything like this. This is not hate speech. I know social media platforms have new standards and things, et cetera. I'm talking about understanding history. And I'm talking about these African-Americans who are under attack, who are defending themselves when the police would not intervene on their behalf. This is so this is history that we're talking about. Now, throughout the summer, African-American veterans around the country took inspiration from the actions of their brethren in Washington, D.C. and Chicago and followed suit in a riot in South Carolina. One preacher uh, reportedly said of the black self-defense units, quote, the males carried their guns with as much calmness as if they were going to shoot a rabbit in a hunt or getting ready to shoot the Kaiser's uh, the Kaiser soldiers, end quote. So for many African-American veterans, um, the there was a broken promise of how they thought they were going to be treated when they came back home. You know, they thought there was going to be respect for them because they served their country. They fought for this country. So as bloodshed spread nationally to South Carolina, Nebraska, Florida, Ohio, you, you're going to have um, race riots that take place. You have, you know, Arkansas. Uh, you, you have over 25 major race riots in this country just just in 1919. Um, com has a good article also from David A. Love from July 28th, 2019. Red summer, 100 years later, when the white mob was unleashed on black America. OK, so you'll see a number of articles written uh about this uh, this year. Uh, so Omaha, Nebraska, you, you have that Chicago, Elaine, Arkansas, Washington, D.C. Um, as bloodshed spread nationally to South Carolina, Nebraska, Florida, Ohio, among others, veterans continue to be targeted. African-American veterans continue to be targeted. At least 13 veterans were lynched across the United States after uh, World War One. Many of them were in uniform, which when worn in public, many white people saw as an affront of America's racial caste system. Once again, they were not coming back in to their lowly place in society. They were not going back and accepting segregation and seeing these black men in these uniforms. Th 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 this was an insult to many white people. OK, so it was the opposite of the reception many African-American soldiers believe they will receive when returning home. Their choice to serve in the war spurred on by intellectuals uh, like Dr. W.B. Du Bois, who believed it would be a path to equality. OK, Professor uh, Simon B uh, Balto, professor of African-American studies, said, quote, World War One was very much a broken promise for basically all African-Americans by the people who felt the brokenness of that, but the people who felt the brokenness of that promise most acutely were the veterans who had gone and risked their lives for this supposed war to make the world safe for democracy and then came home to find that the country was still going to deny African-Americans the privilege of democracy, end quote. Now, this wasn't you. Uh, this wasn't unique to the Red Summer or even World War One. A report by the Equal Justice Initiative at, EG, at EJI dot org found that from Reconstruction, Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877 after the Civil War ends from Reconstruction to just after World War Two. World War Two ends in 1945. Quote, thousands of black veterans were assaulted, threatened abused or lynched following military service. No one was more at risk of experiencing violence and targeted racial terror than black veterans who had proven their valor and courage as soldiers during the Civil War, World War I and World War II, end quote. Despite the events of the Red Summer, 
you're going to have 1.2 million African-American men who are going to enlist in World War II. And I just I just did a presentation dealing with how the GI Bill discriminated against uh, African-American World War II, World War II veterans. There was sixty seven billion dollars invested in the GI Bill from 19 about, about 1946 to 1970. The GI Bill gave low interest loans to uh, white veterans to go to college um start businesses and buy homes and african american gis are largely going to be discriminated against getting these resources okay go watch the video that i did dealing with the gi bill because june 19th 19 uh june 19th 2019 when you had the hr 40 uh hearing in congress uh dr julian malvo who's the african american economist the only african american economist there Dr. Julian Malvo talked about some of these policies after slavery that maldistributed wealth, power, and resources. And one of the biggest ones outside of the massive land giveaways, like the Homestead Act of 1862, the Southern Homestead Act of 1866, and the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, would be the GI Bill of 1944, okay, signed into law by President Roosevelt in 1944. And is going to uh, change the what is going to change the landscape of higher education in this country, open up all types of opportunities for for white men, but largely discriminate against African American GIs. And it, and, and and the GI Bill is going to widen the racial wealth gap. So the conclusion of the summer of 1919 would not be the end of mass violence against African Americans. Far from it. Two years later, we would see the worst instances of racial violence in America in American history. The Tulsa uh, massacre in uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, June 1st, 1921, during which at least 36 people were killed. OK, now, I don't know where she got her numbers for that. The Red Cross put it at 300, at least 300 were killed. OK, so I'm not sure where she got 36. I need to get in contact with her. No, the Red Cross set up a makeshift um hospital in booker t washington high school there in north tulsa okay north tulsa is where the african americans live and they put the count at 300 who were killed almost all african americans all right um so she lists 10 of the people who were killed were white and at least 1256 houses were torched by a white mob yeah now in that in, in that case right there as well and i'm um i have a lecture dealing with the whole history of black wall street so it's at our website africanhistorynetwork.com um and i'm also in the documentary dr boyce watkins did in your black world films resurrecting black wall street the blueprint you had African-American World War One veterans, they're living in North Tulsa as well. And these brothers had guns. These brothers fought back and shot back. OK, so it wasn't just we just laid down and we were killed or we were just running for our lives. No, we fought back. We were just outnumbered and we were outgunned. OK, and they uh, the white people also had a Gatling gun. They had a Gatling gun as well. Gatling gun was, was one of the first machine gun is probably probably the first type of machine gun you see it in westerns okay let's continue here and remember uh be sure to register for the online course that i teach ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school okay that's a uh, eight week 16 hour online course and uh we do that on wednesdays 8 p.m uh eastern standard time 8 p.m to 10 p.m eastern standard time we'll post a link here and um, it's on the, the it's on sale right now, almost 50 percent off. It's on sale. Sixty dollars, regularly one hundred thirty dollars. OK, Shell. Thanks. How you doing, Shell? OK, uh, David. All right. And also, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. It helps us to. Um, Keep doing the research, stay on the air, finance the Sunday night show helps when I have to uh, go out of town and pay to travel because uh, I'll be in Atlanta uh, August 3rd, 2019, Saturday, August 3rd, uh, as part of the Black Agenda uh, tour. We'll be at Finn and Feathers, Michi X, Jice Johnson and myself. 
So we have the information also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, or visit the Black Agenda on Tour.com also. All right, let's continue here. I don't know why the broadcast stopped. All right, so despite the events of uh, the Red Summer of 1919, you have 1 1.2 million African American men who would enlist in World War II. We talked about that. Um, and then you're going to have uh, the conclusion of the, the Red Summer 1919 will not end the mass violence against African Americans. You're going to have the Tulsa race riot of a Tulsa massacre of 1921 in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But after that, 1923, you have Rosewood, Rosewood, Florida, January of 1923. OK, so the Red Summer of 1919 did, however, signal a permanent shift in the way African Americans responded to white violence in the United States and uh, presaged increasing self-defense tactics, tactics, including when African American veterans once again mobilized during the violence in Tulsa, Oklahoma, like I talked about. For many African Americans, the way veterans responded to uh, the bloodshed added a, sil uh, added a sliver of inspiration to the terror of the summer of 1919. Before World War I, the NAACP uh, had a membership of 9,000 members. But by the early 1920s, its membership had um, increased more than tenfold to 100,000 people si signaling a growing boldness and cohesion to the organizing that would eventually plant the seeds of the modern day civil rights movement. So you see, you, you see a constant pushing. Yeah, World War One after World War One, World War Two after World War Two. You see a constant pushing. Um, we see uh, African Americans being pushed out of the Republican Party because of because of the Lily White movement in 1928, and then uh, slowly going over to the Democratic Party because they are pushing their issues, pushing their agendas. OK, so we, we see a constant pushing of our issues, of our case, of our agendas. We see this throughout history, uh, but especially during that period of time, dealing with the Great Migration and, and dealing with uh, after World War One. All right. So. The, um, one of the things is one of the riots that took place was uh, in Oklahoma, okay? And it was the, Oka, uh, the I'm sorry, not Oklahoma, Omaha. The Omaha Courthouse, Omaha, Nebraska, the o Omaha Courthouse lynching of 1919, all right? Uh, and let me post a link here to this article here from history.com. So we'll talk about that here for just a minute because there's a famous uh, picture of a burning charred body of an African-American man laying kind of like on the ground. You see a bunch of white people standing around. I'm not going to show you the picture. Um, I'll post the I'll post an article that has it in it. But a lot of people don't know. When that's from in the circumstances, OK, but that is the uh, Omaha Omaha courthouse lynching of 1919. Then also African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast and email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com will let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. So in a lot of these articles dealing with the Red Summer of 1919, they talk about the Omaha courthouse lynching. And um, I think David A. Love also talks about it in his article in his article for um AtlantaBlackStar.com because I know he talks about a few different um, lynchings here, a few different uh, race rides that broke out. But if we look at the article from BlackPast.org, the Omaha courthouse lynching in 1919, uh, they talk about how it was a part of the wave of racial and labor violence that swept the United States during the red summer of 1919 racial and labor violence. Okay. Because see, there were, there were constant fights and constant tensions, constant tension 
between African Americans and white men over employment, over jobs. And this is um, why these large labor unions were created right after slavery ended to protect these jobs for white men, because there were at least 262 skills, trades and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. And when slavery ends, now we can compete for wages. Now they're trying to protect these jobs for white men. So they create labor unions now, like the National Labor Union created in 1866, the year after slavery ends. So. It was uh, the Omaha Omaha courthouse lynching of 1919 was witnessed by an estimated 20,000 people, making it one of the largest individual spectacles of racial violence in the nation's history. So this is during the Great Migration. Uh, and we know you're going to have uh, tens of thousands of African-Americans uh, moving into northern industrial cities, including Omaha, Nebraska. Um, this is just in the early, I mean, just by the end of 1919, you had 1 million African Americans who had, uh, already left the South from 1915 to 1919, you're going to have a million African Americans who are going to leave the South and go up North. So the growing black population and resentment over job competition by white ethnic groups helped fuel racial tension in Omaha as it did in other cities across the North. Okay. Uh, Omaha, Nebraska saw its African-American population double from 4,426 to 10,315 in the second decade of the 20th century. OK, so going into um, the 1910s, during the 1910s, they saw the population of African-Americans in Omaha, Nebraska double. Now, following a national pattern, the Omaha B newspaper, white newspaper, they were exploited this tension by the summer of 1919, carrying daily newspaper accounts of attacks by African-American males on white women without similar coverage concerning assaults of African-American women by either black or white males. OK, so it's exploiting it's exploiting these tensions. Now, although the other major Omaha, Nebraska newspapers carried carried similar stories, the Omaha B, B E E, sensationalized the news the most, blaming in particular Mayor Edward P. Smith and his hand-picked police chief, Marshall Eberstein. Now, one, per one particular provocative story in September 1919 described an African-American uh, man named Will Brown, W-I-L-L, -L, Will Brown, who was 40 years old. Um, and he was a meat packing house worker who was accused of raping a 19 year old white woman. Her name was Agnes Lobeck, L-O-B-E-C-K. OK, so prior to Will Brown's arrest, the Omaha B. Prior to Will Brown's arrest, the Omaha uh, B carried detailed accounts of the story, along with pictures of w Will Brown and Agnes Lobeck. When police went to Will Brown's residence to arrest him, a mob tried and failed to seize him. And let me try to bring, hold on. This is freezing up. All right. I'm trying to monitor this on the second computer. Okay. Uh, prior to Will Brown's arrest, the Omaha B carried detailed accounts of the story along with pictures of Will Brown and Lobeck. All right. Uh, Will Brown was arrested and held for a few hours in the Douglas County Courthouse in downtown Omaha, Nebraska, largely due to the newspaper story. Uh, a mob of 250 men and women gathered, gathered, gathered in uh, the while working gathered in the white working class area of South Omaha and marched down, uh, marched north into downtown. OK, so you have a mob of 250 white men and women. I, I, I assume all of them were white. You know, um, you may have one who was confused. Uh, but <laughs> it's safe to assume they were all white. So. They're going to gather in a white working class area of South Omaha and march north into downtown. 
and they gathered outside of the courthouse in the late afternoon of Sunday, September 28th, 1919. Now, Mayor Edward P. Smith arrived on the scene and attempted to persuade the rioters to leave. He was struck on the head from behind. A rope was placed around his neck and his unconscious body was strung up, okay? Uh, his, his unconscious body was strung up to a lamp post. He was cut down before he actually died. But the mob then broke into the courthouse, tore off Will Brown's clothing as he was being dragged out. And they hung him from a lamppost and riddled his already dead body with bullets. His body was then tied to a police car, dragged to a major downtown intersection and then burned. Fragments of the rope used to lynch Will Brown were sold as souvenirs for 10 cents each. Numerous photographs were taken, including one which shows, which shows some of the lynchers uh, proudly posing behind Will Brown's charred body. That photo became known around the world as the iconic image of red summer violence. After Will Brown was killed, U.S. Army units arrived on the scene and set up one command post at the intersection of 24th and Lake Streets, which remains the heart of Omaha, Nebraska's African-American community to this day, and another in South Omaha, the neighborhood from which most of the rioters had come. The official announcement was that the 24th and Lake Street post was there to protect African-Americans from further violence, but oral, oral legend in the black community holds that its purpose was to prevent retaliation from African American uh, African Americans who lived there in Omaha, who were waiting on the rooftops of 24th Street with guns. Now, one of the eyewitnesses to the lynching was a young future actor named Henry Fonda, who later remembered, quote, it was the most horrendous sight I had ever seen. My hands were wet and there were tears in my eyes. All I could think of was that young black man dangling at the end of a rope, end quote. OK, so this was Henry Fonda, actor Henry Fonda, father of Jane Fonda, who was there and witnessed the lynching. And he's talking about it years later. All right. Um, read this article from blackpast.org. So Black Past, they have thousands of articles dealing with African-American history, African history, blackpast.org. All right. Uh, the Omaha, Omaha courthouse lynching of 1919. All right. We'll post a link here on the thread of the broadcast for it. And uh, the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com from uh, uh, David A. Love, it actually has, and I saw the article on Facebook, Atlanta Black Star posted on Facebook, but it um, they have the uh, warning graphic picture. They have that little cover on it on Facebook, and you can choose to remove the cover if you want to see it. But uh, check out that article also from AtlantaBlackStar.com. Red summer 100 years later when the white mob was unleashed on black America. So this is, so all this ties into politics, all this ties into economics, all this also ties into African-Americans uh, defending ourselves and, 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 and protecting our communities as well. All this ties in together. And a climate of violence is oftentimes set by who is in office, who are the political leaders. Are they escalating a climate of violence or are they de-escalating a climate of violence? All right. How you doing, Carl? Uh, we have a bunch of people here watching. Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. Uh, this is the second broadcast because the first one stopped, uh, timed out or something. I don't know what happened. Timed out or something. All right. So how do you all like this type of information? But this this ties into what is taking place right now. It ties into this year's theme 
of African American History Month, Black Migrations, ties into these articles that you see about the Red Summer. A lot of people didn't even know about the Red Summer, okay, prior to the uh, last few weeks here. And then the Red Summer was precipitated, and I talked about this on, on our Sunday night show, the silent march of uh, 1917 that took place in uh, New York, uh, up and down Fifth Avenue. And you had about 10,000 African Americans who who had a silent march protesting lynchings, and um, and this was after the uh, this was after the East St. Louis uh, Illinois race riot of 1917. Okay, and that was and that exploded over uh, African Americans. Uh, providing competition for jobs and taking jobs away from white men and an increase in uh, the population in East St. Louis of African-Americans as well. Blackpass.org has an article, uh, New York City NAACP silent protest parade, 1917. This was a silent march. This was looked at as the first mass demonstration of African-Americans against lynching. Uh, one incident in particular, the East St. Louis race riot, also called the East St. Louis massacre, was a major catalyst of the silent parade. This horrific event drove close to 6,000 African-Americans from their own burning homes and left several hundred dead. James Weldon Johnson, the second vice president of the NAACP, brought together other civil rights leaders who gathered at St. Philip's Church in New York to plan protest strategies. Now, this is in 1917. OK, this is during World War One, during basically the third year of the Great Migration, the population of African-Americans going in a uh, uh, living there in East St. Louis. That population had at least doubled. All right. Uh, New York Daily News dot com uh, has an article, Black History Month 2015, Grim Struggle to End Nightmare of Lynching. And uh, this talks about the silent uh, uh, march also. But let's see here. There was one that I had, uh, I have a number of about thousands of articles. There was one I had dealing with the silent, uh, the silent March. Hold on, let me bring this up here because I've posted some articles about this. Blackden.com has an article dealing with the silent March also. But, uh, oh, you know what? I want to look at the one for the um, East St. Louis ride. I, I, did a segment on my show a couple of years ago dealing with the uh, East St. Louis riot. OK, so the silent march uh, took place on July 28th, 1917, July 28th, 1917, 102 years ago. Ten thousand African-Americans marched down Fifth Avenue in silence to protest racial violence and white supremacy in the United States. Um, One of the great accomplishments of, okay, so it, it was precipitated by the East St. Louis riot in East St. Louis, Illinois. Uh, and then also you had the, uh, the year before that, you had the uh, Waco, Texas um, riot as well. In Waco, Texas, a mob of 10,000 white Texans attended the May 15th, 1916 lynching of a black farmer named Jesse Washington, Jesse Washington. One year later, on May 22nd, 1917, a black woodcutter, L. Persons, E-L-L, -L, L. Persons died at the hands of over, uh, over 5,000 vengeance-seeking uh, 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 people in Memphis, Tennessee. Both men were burned and mutilated, their charred body parts distributed uh, and displayed as souvenirs. Even by these grisly standards, East St. Louis later that summer was shocking, simmering labor tensions, simmering labor tensions between white and African-American workers exploded on the evening of July 2nd, 1917. For 24 hours, white mobs indiscriminately stabbed, shot and lynched anyone with black skin. Men, women, children, the elderly, the disabled, no one was spared. This is during now. This is 1917. This is two years before the Red Summer. And this is in the north. This is in Illinois. OK, Midwest North. And this dealt with um, 
the increase in African Americans moving into East Illinois, East St. Louis, Illinois, and the increase in competition African Americans were causing for jobs. Taking so white people are saying they're taking jobs away from us. Okay, kind of like the same. It's kind of like the same language used for undocumented immigrants. All right, so so this article here is from um, the conservation dot com. The conservation dot com. One hundred years ago, African Americans marched down Fifth Avenue to declare that Black Lives Matter. One hundred years ago, African Americans marched down Fifth Avenue to declare that Black Lives Matter. So there was there was about ten thousand of them. All right. This is during this is uh, during a period of time. This is two years after the movie The Birth of a Nation comes out. This is the president at the time is Woodrow Wilson, who's sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan. And this is taking place. All right. So check out this. Uh, see, this is all history. Once again, this is not hate speech. This is not calling people racial epithets. This is not talking about hating anybody. This is talking about a history of what happened. And and we're looking at the uh, 100th year anniversary of the of the Red Summer, the 102nd year anniversary, July 28th, 1917, is when this silent march took place. All right. So to understand what's taking place today, we have to understand the history and understand history. OK, to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. As Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene teaches us, as, as I say, of people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past and the present and the future to meet the needs of the community as well. So we have to understand how do we fight against this? How do we how do we survive these things? How do we survive this system? And we also have to teach it to our children, but the history of African-Americans has to be taught in every school across the country. That's why this study from the Southern Poverty Law Center that you hear me talk about teaching hard history of American slavery is so important. Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. You can download this on SPLCenter.org, SPLCenter.org, the Southern Poverty Law Center. And that is a 52-page study that deals with uh, how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. And it gives numerous recommendations on how to more correctly, more accurately teach the history of slavery. SPLCenter.org. You can download it there. All right. All right, everybody, um, if you like this type of information, you could donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, uh, or at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button. This helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, broadcast our Sunday night show, pay the bills, etc. cetera. Um, go ahead and post your comments here. Go ahead and post your questions here. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be here. A little while longer. Let's see who we have. Sharina, Jimmy, Carl, just a few people on uh, Facebook. Now, who still needs to register for the uh, Wednesday night online course that I teach? Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, who, who still needs to uh, register for that online course? And if you've taken that course in the past, if you've taken it before, the, like the, the previous times I taught it, email me at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and uh, we'll enroll you at 50% off. Okay, let's post the information here. Yeah, we do this class on Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we do a thousands of years of history. All right, and um, let me just go through briefly some of the things that we cover in the online course also. Because um, contrary to popular belief, still, I know a lot of people are commemorating August 20, 16, 19, right? But uh, we were here in this land going back tens of thousands of years. We were here for uh, going back at least 51,700 years ago. But also when you look at the Spanish taking in Africans into the territory called South Carolina, they were doing that in the 1520s. So even though as recently as yesterday, I, I heard someone on MSNBC saying that, you know, we first came to this land 400 years ago. No, we, we've been here for tens of thousands of years. In this land, we call the United States. 
but we don't we don't understand our history. All right, so let's turn the screen share on quickly here. Let me just show you briefly some of the things that we deal with in the online course. And as soon as you register, you can watch the first five classes and um, there's about 36 hours of bonus content also. So I try to deal with things chronologically, okay? Right now we're dealing with how the Moors lost control in Spain. Uh, well, not just Spain, but in Europe. Uh, we, we, we're dealing with the history of the Moors in Europe, the, the Africans known as the Moors who go into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal and bring Europe out of the dark ages and all this thing, all, all this stuff we taught uh, Europeans came back to kick us in the behind also, by the way. Okay, so let me go to this very quickly here. Um, so of course we deal with Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And uh, page 14 of his book, he deals with uh, the African presence that was discovered in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago. There was a discovery made in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. And um, they found uh, artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, footprints and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. Uh, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, uh, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures and tools, uh, 13 different disciplines, thoroughly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least uh, 51,700 years ago. And uh, here's a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. This is an article from ScienceDaily.com, ScienceDaily.com from um, 2004 about his discovery. And here's a summary of what this article, uh, what this article is about. It says uh, radio tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. OK, so who are these humans that they're talking about? So they're talking about the Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA on the planet and go, uh, they come from Southern Africa, they go all throughout the world and uh, they were in this land as well, okay? So, let me get to the, uh, do I have the summary in here? So some of the things we deal with are uh, what is the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play? Because Columbus is, is central to uh, the transatlantic slave trade spreading. And uh, on, on uh, his four voyages uh, starting August 3rd, 1419, uh, August 3rd, 1419, I'm uh, sorry, 1492, when he set sail on the Nina de Penta and the Santa Maria, Columbus is, is um uh, really crucial and central to the transatlantic slave trade starting. This is after the Moors lose control of their last stronghold of Granada in Spain, January, January 2nd, 1492. All this history, this is why we have to study this chronologically. Okay. Historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that happen and lead up to a larger event uh, taking place. OK, so this this is what people really have to understand. Um, you, you know, you, when we look at the transatlantic slave trade, we can look at it um, episodically or we can look at it chronologically. We can look at it episodically or chronologically. And unfortunately, a lot of times people look at it episodically as an episode in history, as opposed to looking at it chronologically and understanding cause and effect. So we have to we have to look at it chronologically. OK, so let me turn the screen share back on because the. The slides that I really want are in this other presentation. All right here. And uh, those in the Atlanta area, I'll be in Atlanta Saturday, August 3rd at Finn and Feathers for the uh, Black Agenda on tour with Michi X and Jice Johnson, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. I'll be doing a presentation that was six principles of political self-defense. 
Six Principles of Political Self-Defense. Visit the Black Agenda on Tour.com for more information or AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, so some of the, uh, some of the other things we deal with. When did Africans first come to this uh, come to the U.S. as slaves? Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? Because uh, that's a complicated history. Um, it's not exactly how we have traditionally been told that history. Were African people in America before the slave trade? Yes, we were. Uh, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, shocking archeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. Uh, I mean, you know, the last time I taught this class, the Clotilda, uh, which was the last known slave ship that came into the US, came into Alabama in June of, um, June of, June of 1860. The Clotilda had not been found like two years ago. They just found the Clotilda earlier this year. So these archaeological discoveries, you know, coming out every month, every other month. Um, insurance companies that took out policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on plantations. OK, a lot of people don't really we know we know some of the history of taking out insurance policies on slave ships, but not on enslaved Africans on the plantations and, and, and those um, uh, slaves that had very dangerous work, maybe working in coal mines or sawmills, uh, you know, things like this. Freemasonry, America and the founding fathers. OK. Uh, origins of the terms America, Africa and more. Uh, M-O-R-E. But also we deal with the origins of the term more M-O-O-R as well. The problem with slave movies while we being bombarded with slave movies and a slave themed TV show. Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus in the Immaculate Conception story. We dealt with that last class. So as soon as you register all these, uh, the previous classes, they're all recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. Freemasonry in America. The fake Willie Lynch letter 1712 because Willie Lynch never historically existed. I repeat, Willie Lynch never historically existed. And uh, many people are familiar with Renoko Rashidi. So I've interviewed, interviewed Renoko a number of times. So we use one of his books as reference in the class as well. Um, let me see here. What was I going to? Malcolm X taught us that the, uh, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and the guilty innocent. And that's power because they control the minds of the masses. What was I going to here? So very quickly here, um, to understand the transatlantic slave trade, you have to understand the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known, known as the Moors, but the Moors losing control. And see, one of the things the Moors are doing is that they're intermixing into the European culture and they're inter they're intermixing. And then you get, um, they're changing the complexion of Europe. You have these Moorish men intermixing with white women and et cetera. And they're changing the complexion of some of these European societies that they're in, especially Spain and Portugal. It's because Spain and Portugal are right above Morocco. Um, and a resentment is going to develop. A res resentment grows against these Moors by Europeans. And you're going to have the, the, the dehumanization that we see exhibited in the transatlantic slave trade and doing, and doing slavery. That dehumanization goes back to the Moors in Europe. It didn't start in 1440 with the Portuguese, who were the first ones to get involved in the transatlantic slave trade. It didn't start there. That stuff is going to develop in Europe and these tensions between these Moors and Europeans are going to happen. Okay. So when we look at something like a symbol like this, and we talked about this last class, when we look at a symbol like this, um, the Washington Monument, right? The Washington Monument is a Tekken. It's an ancient African symbol, symbol of resurrection coming from the story of Asara, Asat, and Heru, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, okay? Um, and this is known as the, uh, th this is the origin of the Immaculate Conception story also. But there were about 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout ancient Kemet. Kemet won the original names for ancient Egypt. Today, they're only about 12. They've been taken to other countries. Some have been destroyed, but they've been taken to other countries like 
uh, Istanbul, Turkey, Paris, France, etc. But when we look at the word Mason or Freemason, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. OK, Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So the whole concept of going to college and getting uh, your credentials in a series of degrees comes from the educational system in the ancient Egyptian mystery system, the educational system that took place in the in the lodges, in the temples in ancient Kemet. All right. And this is adopted by Freemasonry. The um, Freemasonry, they're dealing with a watered down version of teachings that the Moors took into Europe that they got from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, the Nile Valley region of Africa. Uh, read pages 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. This is an excellent, excellent book. And then 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons and 13 of the 39 signers of the um, U.S. Constitution were also Freemasons. OK, so this is Osar, Osset and Heru. OK, and then uh, the Greeks called them Osiris, Isis and Horus. Uh, let me see what else it was really what I was trying to go to. But all right. OK, so that. Um, that's just a brief, a very, very brief overview of what we cover in the eight week, 16 hour online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in the school. When we look at something like this here, this is these are the national flags of uh, Corsica and Sardinia. The French island in the Mediterranean of Corsica and the Italian island of Sardinia. They have African Moors heads on them, okay? And I talked about this a couple of classes ago. They have African Moors heads on them because the Moors were in those areas and when they're conquered and captured and conquered, um, it took a monumental effort to defeat them. So they, they these are the national flags of these islands. Now, you see them with the bandana. Originally, that bandana was a blindfold. And it signified that they were prisoners. But because of tourism and to be politically correct, the blindfolds have now become bandanas. OK, but you can you can go research this yourself. Uh, look at the national flags of Corsica and Sardinia. OK, they have African Moors heads on. Them. So we see the history of the Moors. We see it in language. We see it in architecture, paintings. We see it in the history. We see it in surnames uh, or names of people, uh, just like Maurice, the M-A-U-R-I-C-E. Maurice is in reference to a Moorish boy. The name Maurice, that's in reference to a Moorish boy. We also see it in the bloodline of Europeans. But we can see it in things like this, the representation in these flags also. OK. All right. So. Um, this history is deep and you know it's 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 African history and culture gives us our VIPs it gives us our values our interests and our principles as Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor Jane Small teach uh, two of my teachers and this influences our economics and our politics our economics and our politics are not separate from their foundation, the history and culture. So when we talk about politics, we talk about voters, we talk about a black agenda Well, you have to the the Where your agenda is going to take you is based upon your knowledge of where you have been and your understanding of where you are now. It's a trajectory that history and culture gives you a trajectory. 
gives you your values, your interests, and your principles, your VIPs. This influences your economics, your economic empowerment, as well as your political empowerment. So we have to have a synthesis of all of this. It's not one or the other. It's a synthesis. You know, um, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what, what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Your understanding of history deals with the type of policies that you push to get implemented to deal with the conditions that we experience now. The conditions are the result of historical events, historical movements. Okay, this is one of the things I'll talk about Saturday. In Atlanta, when I deal with six principles of political self-defense, how policies uh, impact the economic conditions of African-Americans, because a lot of us don't understand how this intersects and other people understand how policies and laws impact their communities. OK. All right. Errol, Errol said, Dr. Anthony Browder. Yeah, Tony Browder. Yeah, Anthony Browder. Yeah, I know Tony. I've interviewed him a number of times. All right. So um, African-American business owners, be sure to email us at customer service at African History Network dot com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. And we take your uh, 30 second to 60 second commercial. We can record one for you, but we put it into the audio podcast of our Sunday night show in the broadcast we do throughout the week. There are eight different podcast platforms. And uh, we, uh, we also um, promote your business in the broadcast, the Facebook live broadcast, things like that that we do as well. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Our current promotion, get two months for the price of one. Okay, get two months for the price of one. All right, now, if you're interested in learning about the uh, stock market and learning about investing, visit TheProfitRoom.com. TheProfitRoom.com can help you. Um, this is a... Uh, education company that teaches you about the stock market options, futures, the Forex market, uh, foreign exchange market and more. They also have a mentorship program that's designed for beginners. They teach individuals like yourself how to create generational wealth through trading and investing in the financial markets. Their specialty is also dealing with day trading. All right. So uh, visit the profit room.com. They have uh, also uh six to seven week classes uh, that run periodically. Let them know you found out about this from the African History Network, theprofitroom.com. All right, guys, look, I have to get out of here. Thanks for tuning in. Share this broadcast. Okay, follow us on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network, and then also uh, a person, uh, my, my uh, YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P on YouTube. I think I got through all the articles I want to get through because there's a lot of information here. Uh, remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct for wrong behavior. Who still, who still needs to register for the online course? Let me know if you uh, are interested and still need to register for the online course before I get off of here. How you doing, Latoya? You are OK. We'll post the link here and uh, you can email me if you have any questions. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. OK, we'll post the link here. All right. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.